a diversion of public funds, $145 million as loans to his friends. We got a letter from America in June 2006 listing a number of people to be investigated. Article was one of them. It is December 2008, and the global economy is entering what would be the worst recession in years. The US stock market had just crashed, wiping billions from the global economy. But as this was happening, the US Department of Justice and the Securities and Exchange Commission were bringing to a conclusion years of investigation and were about to file charges against a top European company. The allegations were bribery and corruption involving multiple governments of different countries, one of which is Nigeria. Siemens is a top German corporation and the largest industrial manufacturing company in Europe, headquartered in Munich, with branch offices abroad. Beginning in 2005, Siemens became involved in a multinational bribery scandal. US authorities opened an investigation into the company's activities in 2006, and what they found was stunning. The dirty deals have long been. The investigators found that bribing officials to win contracts was standard operating procedure at Siemens. Over that time period, the company paid around $1.3 billion in bribes in many countries and kept separate books to hide them. One of the allegations in the SEC civil complaint against Siemens was that approximately $2.8 million of the bribe payments was routed through a bank account in Potomac, Maryland in the name of the wife of a former Nigerian vice president. A subcommittee constituted by the US Senate obtained wire transfer records to back up this allegation. According to the US Senate, a vice president's wife, who is a dual US Nigerian citizen living in the United States, served as a representative of a business consultant that entered into fictitious business consultant agreements but did no actual work for Siemens. The purpose of these payments was to bribe government officials. Other corrupt payments included the purchase of watches, that is wristwatches, for Nigerian officials designated in internal Siemens record as P and VP, likely referring to President and Vice President of Nigeria. Siemens pleaded guilty and agreed to pay fines totaling more than $1.6 billion. But who exactly is this Vice President's wife? Jennifer Elizabeth Douglas who has also gone by the names Jennifer Iwenjora, Jamila Abubakar, and Jennifer Douglas Abubakar, is the fourth wife of Atiku Abubakar. According to the Atiku biography, Ms. Douglas was born in Nigeria as Jennifer Iwenjora and worked as a television journalist at the Nigerian Television Authority, NTA, and dated Mr. Abubakar in the early 1980s before leaving for the United States. She lost touch with Mr. Abubakar while attending Howard University. She subsequently married in the United States, took the married name of Jennifer Douglas, but later got divorced somehow. However, this was not before she got naturalized as a US citizen. Ms. Douglas eventually renewed her relationship with Mr. Atiku Abubakar, who came to visit her in the United States. From late 1995 to early 1998, while Sani Abacha was in power in Nigeria, Mr. Atiku Abubakar spent most of his time in Maryland with Ms. Douglas, making occasional visits to Nigeria. In or around 2000, Ms. Douglas became a doctoral student at American University located in Washington, D.C. And in 2007, she received her doctorate degree in international relations. Ms. Douglas and Mr. Atiku Abubakar then married officially in 2003. Since 2000, Ms. Douglas has resided in a luxury home in Potomac, Maryland, a wealthy suburb of Washington, D.C. Maryland property records indicate that Ms. Douglas purchased the house in December 1999 for $1.75 million, and the deed was recorded in January 2000. But in bank account opening documents and tax documents, she had listed her occupation as student and homemaker and sometimes unemployed. She had consistently told the banks where she opened accounts that her husband, Mr. Atiku Abubakar, provided the funds for her accounts. For example, in a November 21st, 2003 letter provided to Citibank, she stated that she received a yearly maintenance income from spouse 
of $500,000. She also said that she received dividends and interest from various accounts and investments totaling about $1,600 per month. In addition, she had assets to $5 million in assets in a Jennifer Douglas Abubakar JDA Family Trust. The letter also stated that Ms. Douglas received a salary of about $62,000 per year from the Jade Foundation which Ms. Douglas had established in 2002. Bank documents show that most of the funds in Ms. Douglas's US accounts came from wire transfers provided by offshore corporations. When her banks asked about these corporations, Ms. Douglas consistently told them that she was unfamiliar with the nature of the offshore corporations, sending her these money. In 2009, when the subcommittee asked her about the Guernsey Trust Company, Let's Go and Sima Holding, and even a certain China Castle investment, Ms. Douglas responded through her lawyer that she has no personal knowledge of these entities. She understood that all deposits came from her husband. This is the Jennifer Douglas mentioned in the CMN's bribery scandal. To be very certain they had the right person, the US subcommittee contacted CMN about this allegation and also reviewed the Citibank account records. The subcommittee identified Citibank records showing three wire transfers from CMN's AG in 2001 and 2002 that together provided over $1.7 million to Ms. Douglas' personal checking account at Citibank. When contacted by the subcommittee, CMS confirmed the information in the SEC complaint and said that the allegations in the complaint referred to payments made by the company to Ms. Douglas and to wire transfers sent to her checking account at Citibank in Potomac, Maryland. CMS told the subcommittee that it had asked an outside law firm to conduct an independent investigation into corruption allegations, which included a review of the payments made by CMS related to Ms. Douglas. The law firm confirmed not only that CMS AG had sent wire transfers to Ms. Douglas' account at Citibank, but also that it had sent a wire transfer to her at another bank and made nearly $2 million in additional cash payments to her over a three-year period from 2000 to 2003. Those wire and cash payments had been made to J.E. Douglas or two companies she beneficially owned. The subcommittee also showed the Citibank wire transfer to Ms. Douglas's legal counsel and requested an explanation of the $1.7 million in wire transfers from CMS to her account but the lawyer did not provide any explanation for those. According to Citibank records, one of the CMS wire transfers for $860,500 was deposited into Ms. Douglas's personal checking account on January 28, 2002. Three days earlier, on January 25, 2002, Ms. Douglas had formed the JIT Foundation Incorporation as a non-profit corporation under the laws of the District of Columbia. The Foundation Articles of Incorporation provided with wide authority to pursue charitable causes. Ms. Douglas denies any wrongdoing, of course, even with all the damning evidence. Now, let's talk about the American University of Nigeria. In addition to opening US bank accounts for her personal use, Ms. Douglas opened several US bank accounts on behalf of American University of Nigeria. Information reviewed by the subcommittee indicates that Ms. Douglas played an active role in AUN's establishment and operation. First, she approached American University in 2002 for assistance in establishing the university and then acted as a liaison between the university and her husband. Since the university's inception, she has served as an unpaid trustee on the AUN Board of Trustees. In addition, Ms. Douglas was tasked by her husband to help pay AUN bills, in particular the salaries of some AUN professors who agreed to teach at AUN but requested payment in US dollars. Bank records obtained by the subcommittee show that AUN utilized several accounts at US financial institutions including personal accounts opened by Ms. Douglas at Citibank and Wachovia and an account opened by Mr. Wendy Fields law firm at SunTrust Bank. Funding for those accounts came primarily from three offshore corporations, the Gwensi Trust Company, Let's Go and Sima Holdings. From 2003 to 2007, American University accepted about $14 million in multiple wire transfers from Let's Go and the Gwensi Trust Company, 
to pay consulting fees for its work related to AUN. So what did we learn from these files on Atiku? During Atiku's first term as Vice President of Nigeria, he was tasked with overseeing the sale of hundreds of poorly managed public enterprises along Nasser Erufai. According to Malam Erufai, a former Director General of the Bureau of Public Enterprises, former President Olushegun Obasanjo and his deputy Atiku Abubakar may have influenced the sales of government enterprises to their friends. Malam Erufai made the revelations while testifying before a Senate committee investigating the privatization and commercialization of Nigerian businesses from 1999 until date. Malam Erufai told the committee that when he ran the bureau, Obasanjo and Atiku contacted him at different times to influence the sale of government companies to their cronies, but that he turned them down each time. You see, Former Nigerian President Olusegun Obasanjo said he made a mistake by choosing former Vice President Atiku Abubakar as his running mate for the 1999 presidential election. Although he had failed to mention his own role in sabotaging the privatization efforts. In 2018, Obasanjo said Atiku has corruption cases outside Nigeria that he must go and answer to and he noted that it would be unfair of him to support such a character, even though he supported him later on in 2019. To vindicate the former president's claims, a former media aide to Atiku, Michael Achimogo, revealed phone conversations where Atiku justified siphoning money via special purpose vehicles. One of the accounts reportedly received 100 million naira from former Plateau State Governor Joshua Darie who was convicted for corruption on that account. Atiku explained in the audio published by Achimogo that when the governor sent donations, he sent it to Marine Float. He stayed in the Marine Float. All these corruption allegations were believed to be part of the reasons why Atiku was reportedly banned from entering the United States. But if Atiku was banned from the US, how was he recently able to return to the US? You see, in November 2018, Atiku signed a contract with Ballard Partners, a Florida-based lobbying firm, for $1.1 million. Not only has Ballard Partners been taxed with helping maintain political and security conditions free of intimidation and interference in the election, the firm will also lobby to strengthen the relationship between the US and Nigeria. Unsurprisingly, Ballard Partners had deep connections and ties to former US President Donald Trump. It was founded by Brian Ballard, who has lobbied on behalf of the Trump Organization for over a decade and chaired the Trump Victory Organization in Florida during the US elections. To confirm these allegations, I searched through multiple sources and I found this interesting revelation. According to the People's Gazette, Atiku Abubaka paid $16.5 million to an American firm to help him procure visa to Washington in the run-up to the 2019 presidential vote. This is according to disclosure filings seen by People's Gazette. The deal was signed on October 26, 2018, three weeks after Mr. Abubakar clinched the presidential nomination of the opposition party, People's Democratic Party, to challenge President Muhammad Buhari in the February 2019 elections. An election he lost, bringing his total losses at the polls to five. So my question is, why does he want to be president so bad? Is there a story there too? Thanks for watching this episode of Declassified. What do you think of Atiku Abubakar? Let me know in the comment section below.